Today is a very exciting day, my friends, for on this day, the 24th of February, 2023, Kerbal Space Program 2 was released to the public, and I think we all remember what those first few months of early access were like. There were glitches, and there was wobble, and there were glitches, and there was wobble. <laughs> and a litany of other interesting bugs, like how the Kerbal Space Center sometimes just decided to leave the planet and I guess just chill with you in space. <laughs> anyway, I think it's a pretty objective statement at this point to declare that the game, while obviously still not perfect, has come along leaps and bounds. But how many leaps, and indeed, how many bounds? To answer this question, I thought it might be fun to do a classic KSP mission, Apollo-style MUN, but with the twist, we're gonna do it twice, once in KSP2, and once in release day KSP2, on the one year anniversary, to see how much things have changed. Now if for some reason you want to do this yourself, then you can downgrade KSP2 to whatever version you want, using the beta options tab in Steam, but honestly, why would you? You could just watch me suffer along instead. <laughs> so let's get things rolling. We're gonna start off in KSP2's release version, since this version lacks a lot of the parts currently available in the most recent version. I'm gonna build the rocket in this version, so that we can then just copy it across to the latest install without needing to make any modifications, to make this as fair of a comparison as I possibly can. I picked Apollo Style Mun as my mission for this challenge for a couple of reasons. First, my first ever KSP2 video I uploaded on this channel was an Apollo Style Mun mission, and that was made on an even earlier version of KSP2's first public release, since it was the game build I played at the pre-release event in Amsterdam. The other reason I picked Apollo Style Mun is because going anywhere else in release date KSP2 is very difficult due to that glitch. You know the one, right? If you don't, then oh, I envy you. <laughs> the glitch will rear its ugly head during this mission very early on. If you think you know the one I mean, then comment it below and we can see if you got it right. <laughs> But speaking of glitches, as you might be able to tell, it looks like the rocket is pretty much done, right? I did take it for a quick test flight and realized that this happened. The stack separator that separates the command module and the lander ended up just getting stuck to the engine bell for some reason. I don't know why this was happening. So I had to go back to the vehicle assembly building and swap it out for a larger stack separator piece. So that's uh, an example of one modification I had to make in order to get around the bugs of KSP2 release version. But with that, the rocket is complete. Let's get it on the pad in both KSP2 release state and KSP2 now state. <laughs> One of the things most clear immediately is the big graphical improvement between KSP2 release and KSP2 now. And look at that, Tim C. Kerman is ready for launch. Right before launch though, Tim C. Kerman had to bail out of the rocket and leave completely unexpectedly. The reason for this was that he received a notification that someone had impersonated him on LinkedIn with a frightening amount of accurate personal details. Clearly some ne'er-do-wells have created a shadow profile of him for nefarious purposes. If only he'd used Incogni, a powerful tool that helps you reclaim control over your personal data online and keep it safe from data brokers and trackers who have sponsored today's video. Incogni is actually something I use myself, and I think that their service is something incredibly valuable. Your personal details are out there being sold and distributed by data brokers to all kinds of sites, and it's frankly inevitable that at some point one of these sites will have a data breach in the near future. Incogni helps protect your data by contacting data broker companies, requesting removal of your name from their databases, ensuring your personal information remains private and secure. Why should you care? Well, like poor old Tim Kerman, your data can be collected, bought and sold, which can result in the denial of bank loans and credit cards, or result in higher insurance rates, leaving you vulnerable to all kinds of manipulation and social engineering, and it can even result in you having your identity stolen. According to the 2022 Annual Data Breach Report by the Identity Theft Resource Centre, the number of victims has gone up nearly 41.5% from 2021. Incogni offers simple and affordable pricing options, and the best part of their annual subscription is that they'll continually send removal requests for as long as you use the service, ensuring that your data is not only removed, but stays removed. 
ready to take control of your privacy, then join me and countless others who are saying goodbye to data breaches and hello to peace of mind. And for viewers of this channel, you can get an amazing unique discount. Take your personal data back with Incogni. Use my code MATLOWN at the link below and get an amazing 60% off an annual plan. That's incogni.com slash MATLOWN. Since Tim C. Cum was piloting the rocket in the current version of KSP2, we'll have to start with our rocket in KSP2's release state, which as you can see has been piloted by Jeb, Bob and Val. <laughs> yes, the frame rate, despite this being a pretty simple rocket, is not very kind to me in KSP2. Let's hope Tim C. Kerman is back at the pad and we can watch the rocket launch in the latest version. Yes, we've got a much more consistent frame rate in this game, and the atmospheric effects look a lot nicer as well. So I think we'll stay with KSP2's latest version for now. There's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it, saying latest version and release version. From now on, I'll, I'll call them KSP then and KSP now. And we can just, that's the label I'm going to use from now on. Probably should have picked that at the beginning of the video, not five minutes in. Anyway, I know the performance of the two games is going to be a big point of difference. So just for clarification's sake, it's probably obvious. But I have sped the footage of this part of the flight because I want to get to the, the actual bit in space. Uh, now, I didn't do my gravity turn particularly efficiently because I flew this mission after flying the mission in the first version of KSP2. And that game ran at a significantly lower frame rate, so the whole gravity turn took longer. Then I suddenly started doing it in this version, and obviously things went smoother. I ended up being too slow with my gravity turn because, um, you know, I was used to doing it on a slower time scale, if that makes sense. And speaking of KSP then, I wonder how the rocket is doing in that version. I've sped the footage up just to smooth out the frame rate, but, uh, Oh, uh, yes, the rocket is a bit noodly. There are struts in this thing, clearly an insufficient number of struts because the front of the rocket really is wobbling about quite a bit. As we approach our stage event, what's interesting actually, I didn't realise that the fuel gauge UI has changed, hasn't it? Uh, I, th I much prefer the new fuel gauge UI, if you ask me. <laughs> this is watching the front of the rocket just pogo stick as we detach that lower stage, and then we can fire the Rhino engine and continue our ascent. The rocket is a bit more stable now, but it's definitely still a little bit wobbly, isn't it? Let's just rewind to see how KSP now handled that staging event. I mean, there is still a tiny amount of flex, isn't there, in the front of the rocket. If you look at kind of the, uh, the fuel tank and the fairing that surrounds it, there's a little bit of flex, but to be honest, it's pretty okay. insignificant, I would say. This vehicle is a, a lot more stable than the other one. Now, ordinarily, I would be faithful to the Apollo-style mission plan in that we would leave the ship configuration as is, perform our circularization around Kerbin, and then perform another burn to get us on the way to the Mun. However, cutting back to KSP then, I mentioned earlier that I had a bit of a problem with the stack separator bugging out when it came to separating the vehicle, so I decided to just reconfigure the ship as early as possible to give me as much time as possible to revert the flight and fix things if it bugged out again. So, made for a bit of an interesting challenge really, I had to do a bit of a, a danger configuration, get the whole thing uh, reorganised before reaching my Kerbin apoapsis. So, it was a bit of a race against time this. As you can see, it all began with a bit of a glitchy fairing deployment to get the ship exposed. Then we can get a Kerbal out on EVA and get them into the lander. Again, this is not accurate to the Apollo missions, but I, run I wanted to get things right the first time. One of the things I was trying to do when playing KSP then is avoid using any quick saves. So I made quick saves as I went along, but I didn't want to have to load any quick saves because... I didn't want to, like, induce a bug in the process, and I, I was actually successful. Spoiler alert. It's not really a spoiler because it's never, it's not like a plot point of the video. Uh, but I did, I did this whole mission without doing any quick saves or quick loads. Thank goodness. So as a consequence of that, uh, I didn't actually encounter that many bugs in KSP then. Ironically, I'm pretty, I don't do a count. Maybe someone could do a tally and write it in the comments who gets this right first. Um, I'm pretty sure I ran into more bugs in KSP now compared to KSP then. Obviously, the experience for KSP now is leagues ahead of KSP then. You might notice throughout this video, like right clicking apart, there's this big lag moment while the parts manager loads up, which that lag doesn't exist anymore. And just the general performance of the game and the wobbliness, you know, it, it was a much better experience playing the game now. 
Speaking of which, let's see how that whole maneuver went down in KSP now. First of all, we've got clean separation of the fairings in a non-glitchy way. I'm going to speed the footage up because I don't want you to be guys to get too bored watching the same thing happen twice for every step of the missions. We'll play it nice and fast. Uh, but yeah, it's a much prettier game, first of all. And again, this went by pretty smoothly. I really didn't need to do this danger maneuver at this point because it already confirmed the rocket had worked in a much more buggy version of the game. But I thought, hey, you know, we'll try to make it the same mission for both versions of the game. One bug that I seem to have in both versions of the game, I don't know if you caught it, was when I was controlling the command module. I wasn't able to right click the docking port of my target and set it as target. I had to sort of switch between vessels a few times in order to get that to appear in the parts manager. A bit weird, not sure why, what was happening there. Anyway, as you can see, we are now beginning our circularization in KSP now. Uh, I wasn't quite quick enough with our reconfiguration, so we're going to end up with a pretty eccentric orbit. Uh, there, there we are. Uh, I wonder if I did any better in KSP then. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, slightly more uh, difficult to control because you can see all that uh, flexing happening across the vehicle. But otherwise, I actually did a bit better. Still eccentric, yes, but not quite as eccentric as in KSP now. Not sure. What I've learned from this, really. Oh, there's another example of that massive lag that happens whenever you right-click a part in KSP. Then, honestly, I forgot how frustrating that was. Anyway, let's deploy the solar panels of our command pod and get to planning the next phase of our mission. We're going to stay in KSP then, because this is the glitch that I was talking about. You know, I said back in the earlier in the video, I said one of the reasons I wanted to go to the Mun rather than anywhere else in KSP2 version 1 is because of that glitch. Well, this is that glitch. We make a maneuver plan, as you can see, to get to the Mun. But look, there is no orbital line that passes the Mun. I mean, we obviously have an orbit passing the Mun because those concentric circles... Oh, circles? Why did Wait a bit, Sean Connery for a second then, didn't I? Uh, we've got those concentric circles showing our entry and exit from the Mun's sphere of influence, but there's no line there, so we can't really plan how to get there. So for doing something like a Juno mission, this can actually result in the mission being a lot more fuel inefficient because we have to do a very, very eccentric capture rather than being able to use the Oberth effect efficiently or indeed planning aero captures. But the Mun is unique in that you really don't need to use the maneuver planner in order to get a nice encounter with it. The way you do this is what I'm doing now. We're just time warping around Kerbin, keeping an eye on the horizon. And as soon as we see the Mun appear, there it is, we're going to burn prograde. And this is going to get us on an optimal Mun encounter. No maneuver plans required. I'm actually going to put us on a Mun collision course, so that when we detach that lower stage, it'll crash into the Mun surface, not get left in space, and then we can, oh, bit of a lag as we open the map screen there. They get lots of little random lag spikes in the game that I just completely left my memory, <laughs> it seems. And then we can use our command pods engines to place ourselves back on a Mun flyby course rather than a Mun collision course, so that our kerbals, you know, don't, don't crash into the surface of the Mun. That would be pretty bad. <laughs> and there we are. Mun collision achieved. Now, before stage, I was about to stage, and then I suddenly recalled, actually, I remember in the early versions of KSB2 that fuel, look, see, uh, uh, the mouse hovered over decoupler. Then I remembered that fuel could be a bit glitchy in the early versions of KSB2. So let's just check. Yes, look, our Rhino engine has just drained the lander's fuel, despite there being fuel in that S3 7200 tank. So I'm not sure... What happened? So I quickly pumped fuel back into the lander. Shouldn't have happened in the first place. And, and then we can decouple. I just I just remembered there are a couple of videos of mine. I think when I went to uh, the Val subsurface ocean, uh, when it came to deploying my lander, I had no fuel because during ascent, the ascent stage, it just pulled all the fuel out of the lander. Super weird. But I'm glad that I remembered this glitch existed prior to our staging. Anyway, that was really the only noteworthy big bug when it came to this phase of the mission. Let's just see how things went in KSP now. As you can see, first things first, immediately we have a maneuver plan to follow because I was actually able to plan a MUN flyby that took us on an equatorial plane because I could see the path that my orbit would take as it passed the MUN because that orbital line glitch was patched out luckily fairly quickly after the game came out. And with the burn completed, I'm going to speed the footage up quite a bit now, we can course correct so that our lander and command module don't hit the MUN. I'm just going to do a quick retrograde burn once the stages have separated a little bit more. And there we are, nice perhaps of about 43 kilometers. And it should go without saying that the fuel glitch I had in KSP then didn't happen this time. And then we can just time warp up to the Mun, I suppose. We'll stay in KSP now because it's just a prettier looking game for the... For the this is a video, it's a visual medium, we want it to look as good as possible, right? But our journey to the Mun in KSP then, it wasn't that eventful, there were no major glitches. Unlike our journey to the Mun in KSP now, what? 
You see, it all began with our retrograde burn at Mun Periapsis. All started off fine. In fact, nothing went wrong with the burn, but I got a bit impatient, and I activated physics time warp. But then, when I dropped out of time warp, my velocity stopped changing, despite the fact that our fuel is still burning, and I couldn't... My thro the throttle gauge was locked. I couldn't get out of this time warp state. I don't know what happened. So I had to do a quick load and reattempt the burn. Yes, ironically, it was in KSP2 now that I had to actually use quick loads to get around glitches. I didn't have to do that in KSP then. Although, admittedly, I was a bit more blasé about using things like time warp just to speed things up in KSP now. Because I know it's more stable, so I could just take risks like that. I didn't use physics time warp in KSP then. Speaking of KSP then, though, we've now circularized around the moon somewhat eccentric orbit in KSP now. Let's do the same in KSP then. So one thing that's apparent is it looks like the bump map for the moon surface does not look as good as it did in KSP now. Uh, I'm guessing that's just like due to the lighting engine changes and stuff. Well, I guess not the lighting engine itself, but you know what I mean, right? The lighting graphical effects. And also kind of the UI for the actual orbital line itself looks a bit more... I don't know, not as clean as it does in KSP now. So it's, it's interesting doing a mission like this, actually, because it makes me a bit more appreciative of kind of the little changes that changed. Oh, there's another bug that doesn't exist. Paige just randomly showing up. Yeah, the little changes that changed gradually. So I might not have noticed it at first because I was more interested in the fact that a very egregious bug had been removed. So now I can kind of appreciate the finer things that the developers did to make the game, you know, less rubbish <laughs> than it was uh, when it first came out. I didn't trust the Kerbal Manager in KSP then, like I trust it now so I actually just EVA'd a Kerbal to get her on the lander there's the lander separating kind of induced a bit of phantom velocity as we undocked can't really see much going on in KSP then but we could see a bit more in KSP now because I decided to purposefully learn from my mistakes I made the first time I did this mission in KSP then and I ensured that we would begin our Mun descent on the light side of the Mun so we can actually see what happens and also you know again We've already discussed that the graphics of this game look a bit better than the other one. So let's just try and show you as much footage from this version as we can compared to the other version of the game. I will just point out though how smooth the deployment of our landing legs went just then. Uh, this is how they went down in um, KSP then. As you can see, there's a little bit of a... Uh, seemed to hit something as they uh, as they extended. So I'm glad that glitch doesn't really exist so much anymore. Anyway, we're back in the current version of KSP2. Playing the footage back nice and fast, we can get to the next exciting part of the mission. It's our landing. I had to sort of alternate between retrograde burning and then just point burning straight up because I was descending a little bit too fast for comfort. I wanted to get clear of this kind of steep ridge and land on this flat part of the mun. There you can see it coming into view. I will slow the footage down to normal speed to show our actual touchdown. Here we go. I always try and keep my touchdowns below five meters per second if I possibly can. Just because it feels a bit more realistic. There we are. A beautiful little touchdown from our lander just there. Tim C. Kerman and Jebediah Kerman are comfortable on the surface. Let's see how Bob Kerman and Valentina Kerman got on in KSP then. Here we are coming in for a touchdown. Oh, a bit of a sink from the landing legs. But if anything, it looks like the suspension actually worked a bit better on those landing legs. Again, I literally just cut and pasted the craft between the both versions of the game. So no changes were made to the behavior of the landing legs or anything like that. And I think this isn't like a criticism of either version, but I think I managed to pick a better landing spot for this version of the game. There you go, taking a little window screenshot. Interesting view of the of Kerbin just there, sort of looking like a little marble at the top of that mountain. That was a very picturesque little angle just there. Hmm, yeah. Anyway, let's go out on EVA. Oop, the, uh, the lander decided to do a little jump. Not sure quite why that happened. Let's see if that happens in KSP now. Here we go, Tim C. Cohen getting out. And, oh, again, a little bit of a movement from the lander. Not quite as dramatic as before, but still. Mm, so something still needs a little bit of work doing there. As Tim C. Cohen, look at that big old smile on his face. We can plant a flag at our landing site to commemorate this momentous occasion. We'll let the animation play out in this version of the game. We can have a little look at that. Oh, is that going to make the thumbnail? Who knows? And look at that! The flag worked! It often doesn't work these days. It just goes to the default flag. So it's nice to see our custom flag working well. And in fact, actually, I've gone back to KSP then, so we can have a look. Uh, the custom flag worked in this version of the game as well. The UI didn't quite fully disappear when I pressed F2, but that's okay. Ready? The flag's going to deploy. And then... Oh! He just decided to walk away. I'm not pressing anything on the keyboard at this stage. Literally, he planted the flag and then just, you know, refused to elaborate and left. I then uh, pressed something on the keyboard to make him stop, and then he just started doing a little dance on the spot. I don't know if we learned anything from this. <laughs>
But regardless, it's time to think about heading back. So um, whilst I'd cut away to KSP then, uh, in KSP now we'd actually got both of our couples out on EVA for a little Instagram photograph opportunity. And then right before Tim C. Kerman got back on board, he of course can take a surface sample because this is something we can do in the newest version of the game. This is not a science mode, or I should say exploration mode playthrough, so we won't get any science points, but hey, it's nice just to do watch the little animation play out. Then he can deploy his EVA pack. Oh, in fact, he doesn't even do that. He just jumps up and gets back on board. Were things as smooth for the other version of the game? Spoiler alert, they weren't. Let's have a look. First of all, a little bit of a, a glitchy walk towards the rear side of the lander, and then I decided to use my EVA pack to pilot towards the ladder, but it wasn't working. It's that glitch where the EVA pack stops working completely, like it would deploy, but then the thrusters won't work. So then I had to sort of try and jump onto the ladder, much like I did in the other version of the game. Uh, what I'm doing here is I, for some reason, thought you could actually manipulate your momentum what, after you jumped without the EVA pack. I don't know why, because I thought this was like Mario or something like that. <laughs> I've been playing a lot of Marvel's Spider-Man, so I guess I'm just used to jumps being... Like a, a superhero, <laughs> for want of a better term. Anyway, let's just time warp ahead to the point at which we uh, take off from the Mun in order to get back to the mothership. Here we go, ascending as we can tuck those landing legs away. And luckily, there were no phantom forces when they were packing up this time. And we can play the footage back nice and fast, I guess, to get to back to the um, <laughs> great sentence and speaking right there. Uh, get back to the mothership. So it's not quite an equatorial orbit. So I'm sort of moving between the 90 degree vector on the nav ball. And and the 45 degree vector on the navel so we're kind of lined up with our target vessel how close did we get not not hugely close to be honest in fact we're going to be rendezvousing on the dark side of the man which uh, especially in this version of the game which is even darker than the current version there isn't really much to see so let's just go and let's just watch the whole rendezvous in ksp now uh, just because it's a bit more of a pleasant viewer experience for the aforementioned reasons and also because again i learned from my previous mistakes this was the second mission i did the first time i did this mission i did it in ksp then and so i remembered i was like aha uh -huh. I, I docked on the dark side, couldn't see anything, not great for viewer experience. Let's try and get our rendezvous on the light side of the Mun. And as you can see in this very sped up footage, that's what we're doing. We're getting it just to that kind of terminus point so that when we actually do the rendezvous itself, it'll be kind of a nice sunrise. And there we are, the Mun disappearing below us. We're now obviously on the dark side, but we have got a nice light of a Kerbin rise in the distance there as I do a quick maneuver to get our uh, encounter to be nice and close. There we are. I was trying to get it below 500 meters and we've done it. And now I'm just doing some little quick burns with RCS using J, K, L, I, H and N on the keyboard. And look at that. We've got it to 25 meters separation, which is a... Uh, Pretty good, if I do this it myself. Now we're getting nice and close. We can point retrograde relative to our target, kill off all of our velocity, and then we should only have to do like one small burn in the direction of the target ship, which, you know, we have now have visual confirmation of before we get close enough to perform our final docking. So here we go. That's about as close as I think we can need to get. Then we can switch to the other vessel, activate SAS, and point ourselves towards our target. That's right, we're going to do loud and lazy method of docking. Why wouldn't you? It's the superior method of docking, everyone knows. And then we'll just do a nice slow... Slow, let's just speed the footage up. <laughs> Here we go, it's now been sped up four times faster than real life. There we are. A beautiful docking. The ship is now ready to get home. Or is it? Cannot create maneuver, no fuel. What? I've got this weird, this is shaking the mass out frustration. I tried doing various little tricks like, you know, deactivating and reacting fuel crossfeed of the docking ports, seeing if we could just use the Terrier engine, not the Poodle engine, and vice versa. Nothing worked. I couldn't fix this. I even did a quick save, quick load. Uh, nothing fixed it. So for the rest of the mission, we can't make maneuver plans. Did the same happen for KSP then? Let's find out. As you can see, no, I, I skipped through the whole docking process because I feel like it's not the most exciting thing to watch more than once. And as I already mentioned in this video, this place at night couldn't really see much going on. So we can skip through. But as you can see, we've been able to make a maneuver plan and it was all fine. And it makes me rem remember that actually the maneuver plan UI is, used to be horrible compared to what it is now. So I'm glad they changed that. Let's just go back to Kerbin in this in this version of the game and then we'll go back and do it again in KSP now. Oh! Hey, there's a return of an old classic, the the classic paused, unpaused bug. I don't know why I'm saying it with such like uh like I like I yearn for those times again. Like I definitely don't miss this bug, but oh, in that bit, get weirdly nostalgic somehow. But in just a second, we'll have completed the final burn of this mission. There we are. So not much more now to do, other than I guess time warp back to Kerbin and re-enter the atmosphere. 
Although, as you can see, that part didn't quite go to plan. I got a bit overzealous with time warp, and now we've got the paused, <laughs> unpaused bug again. So I was like, oh, bloomin' heck, we're still we're in the atmosphere. Let's quickly get everything undocked and staged. And then I realized we've actually finished passing through the atmosphere. Look at our altitude above the sea. We're approaching 50 kilometers. So we've obviously done our atmospheric pass, and because of time warp, we didn't get any air resistance. We're going to be uh, entering the vacuum of space once again. Let's just speed the footage up a little bit and... Uh, Warp around to our secondary entry attempt. See if we can actually capture this time. We're going to be a bit more cautious with the old time warp. And as you can see, things went a little bit more successfully this time. We are re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. Kerbin's atmosphere, sorry. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Um, and I like the fact you can sort of see the Kerbals through the glass of the cockpit. And there we are. The, um... Bit ugly, innit? <laughs> the graphics of this game. I think we got a bit spoiled by the new clouds and atmospheric scattering KSP2's most recent versions. I mean, especially the anti-aliasing around the clouds. Like, uh, I mean, the anti-aliasing of the ship with the clouds in the back. You see, it's got a very fuzzy edge. And the sea itself doesn't look that great. Parachutes have deployed, though. That's good. Let's just speed the footage up until we get to Splashdown. Because I want to highlight something else that has been improved in later versions of the game. Here we are. Splash. And then it just sort of, like, you see what I mean? The, the ship's just sort of lying there a bit awkwardly. It's not really... I can't get it to float. Like, I can't get it to sit realistically, like with heat shield down floating in the water. Bit rubbish. However, I'm then going to make a quick save and then load that quick save in the latest version of Kerbal Space Program too, and we'll see how things look now. Isn't that just perfect for a direct comparison between the two versions of the game? The sea looks so much nicer, the reflections on the water look brilliant, the actual graphics look okay. Oh, I've recovered the vessel now, so this this is me now loading the craft back up in this version of the game to film the mission that you've been watching so far into the video. So let's get to the actual point that we got to before I cut away to KSP then. Here we go. As you can see, I'm commencing our escape burn from the MUN. Obviously, I couldn't make a maneuver plan to do this because, as we mentioned, the maneuver plan tool broke because the game, for some reason, it erroneously thinks I don't have any fuel, despite the fact that it's displaying how much fuel we have left. So I'm not quite sure what's actually causing this glitch, but regardless, couldn't fix it, so we're doing this burn uh, entirely without the maneuver planner. I just burned prograde when we were uh, in front of the MUN, so that it will then raise our apapsis to go behind the MUN, which will then get us on a trajectory that takes us to a lower orbit around Kerbin. It wasn't perfect, as you can see. I couldn't get our periapsis to intersect Kerbin's atmosphere. I guess if I'd carried on burning, you know, it would have, but it was just a pain to me to be doing such an inefficient burn. So I cut the throttle, time warped up to be in orbit around Kerbin, then we can do another retrograde burn from here to finally lower our periapsis to be within Kerbin's atmosphere. There we are, the burn's all done. So I guess there's nothing more to do other than just time warp down and stage. There we are. And I, I always like doing a bit of danger staging, you know, oh, some... Weird visual glitch on the lower stage, I've just noticed. I always like to do a bit of danger staging, you know, as soon as we enter the atmosphere with every stage, we get a nice fireworks display to watch. In addition to obviously this beautiful re-entry heating, and I guess this is one of the other big differences between KSP then and now, is that we now have deadly re-entry, and that's why I fitted a heat shield to the rocket. Even though we didn't need it for KSP then, we do need it for KSP now. And there we are, and yeah, we've got that beautiful atmospheric scatter coming in, but this time, this time we're not going to be landing in the ocean. As you can see, we're coming down on a very sketchy looking mountain range. Hopefully everything will be fine, but you know, with the landing of this vessel, that's pretty much the video wrapped, and I think it's been a really interesting journey, actually. I don't know if you agree. Uh, see how the game has changed. Maybe this could be like an annual tradition. Every every 24th of February, or, you know, the nearest Saturday, I'll upload a uh, another video comparing the release version of KSP2 with the most up-to-date version. Uh, I don't know if when colonies and stuff are added, the game is going to be so vastly different to what it was that it's completely irrelevant to comparison. We'll have to just decide at the time. But thank you for watching, and thank you, my Patreon supporters and my YouTube channel members. Their names are, of course, on the left there. They make all of this content possible, as do our amazing sponsors. This time it was Incogni. Huge thanks to them for sponsoring this video. And that's it. Once again, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, then leave a like below. But that's it. I don't know what next week's KSP2 video is going to be yet. Maybe a continuation of my exploration tutorial series playthrough. Who knows? Suggestions are always welcome in the comment section below. This is a horrible time to mention all this because we're running out of time. And that's it. That's the end. Goodbye.